Hello, this is a message I gave on fundamental belief number 14 of the Adventist Church, our belief number 14. If you do a Google search on the 28 beliefs of the Adventist Church, you should be able to find the PDF of the fundamental uh, beliefs, and this is the fifth, uh, 2015 edition, and I'm dealing with fundamental belief today and number 14, the unity of the body of Christ. I hope this message is a blessing to you. Fundamental belief number 14. Okay, so we're going to look at the fundamental belief. I have it all all uh, written out. You can have a copy of these beliefs, beliefs of the Seventh-day Adventist Church. You could look at them and you could study them on your own. And so um, hopefully that will be a blessing to you. And hopefully it will give you an understanding of what Seventh-day Adventists believe or what we're supposed to believe. Today I'm on Fundamental Belief 14. So let's take a look at Fundamental Belief 14. Here it is. And the church is one body with many members, called from every nation, kindred, tongue, and people. In Christ we are a new creation. Distinctions of race, culture, learning, and nationality, and differences between high and low, rich and poor, male and female, must not be divisive among us. We are all equal in Christ who by one spirit has bonded us into one fellowship with him and with one another. We are to serve and be served without partiality or reservation. Through the revelation of Jesus Christ in the scripture, we share the same faith and hope and reach out in one witness to all. This unity has its source in the oneness of the triune God who has adopted us as his children. Okay, so that is the belief. And I wanted to uh, speak a little bit on that belief. The unity of the church, the unity of the body of Christ. Why is it important? Why does it matter? Well, one of the things that we learn from Scripture is that when we are unified in the Holy Spirit, when we have that unity of faith, we are fortified against the enemy, against worldliness, against false doctrines. I'm going to take a minute here to show you this, this little illustration that I have. So in this illustration, there is a glass jar that represents the spirituality of the church. The spirituality of the church. Okay, and here we see that it is empty, in other words, pure. That's what it symbolizes, pure. Healthy. Now here the fingers represent the members of the church. Now when they're not unified, the seeds representing worldliness or the seeds of destruction are able to pollute the spirituality of the church and to enter into the church for its destruction when the members, symbolized as those fingers, are not unified. Now we're going to see the same illustration, and obviously now I'm going to show what happens when the church has that unity and harmony, as the fingers now are going to be put together, signifying unity and harmony of the body of Christ. And 
so when the seeds of destruction and the seeds of worldliness attempt to enter into the church, they are blocked by those members who have that true unity of the Spirit. Okay, so I want to um, read a passage in relation to that illustration in the book of Ephesians. And I'm going to turn to Ephesians chapter 4. Now the Bible refers to the, the church, the local church, as the body of Christ, as we could see in Romans 12 and 1 Corinthians 12. Here I want to go to Ephesians chapter 4. And here in Ephesians chapter 4, it tells us, starting in verse 11, And he, that is Jesus himself, gave some to be apostles, some prophets, okay, and then it says, some pastors and teachers. So, he gave some to be apostles, some prophets, some pastors, some teachers. And then it says in verse 12, for the equipping of the saints for the work of ministry. So, the leaders of the church are to equip the saints, the, the members, for the work of ministry. Now, let's see what happens for the edifying of the body of Christ. So the church is the body of the Christ. And and the church, the, the local church, we're speaking, the, the church in Ephesus or in the book of Romans, we're talking about the church in Rome or in the book of uh, First and Second Corinthians, the church in Corinth. So here the local church is equipped, is equipped when these leaders do their job and when members are filled with this apostolic spirit. You see, the apostolic church was a church where if you were a member, you were a worker. You were learning to use your talent. Now, Jesus had all the talents. Jesus had all the talents. He had the healing. He visited people. He, he ministered to the needs of everyone. There was not a talent. There was not a gift because we read of the gifts of the spirit. We read of the gifts of the spirit in 1 Corinthians 12 and in Romans chapter 12 as well. But we don't, as as members of the body of Christ, we as individuals, as individuals, we don't have all of the gifts. So when we look in the book of Acts chapter 6, we saw that the apostles were given the ministry of the word. But there were, there were those that were shut in. And so the deacons, the deacons were to minister to those shut-ins, to those widows. And so that the apostles could do the ministry of the word. Now in the church, we don't have all the gifts like Christ does, but everybody has a gift. And we are accountable to Christ and to the local church for using our gifts. So now during this pandemic, when, when churches are shut up and shut away and people are shut out, and there is this tendency or there is this temptation perhaps to fragment, to come apart, to no longer consider our duty to the local church. But we have a duty to the local church. And now is the time for us to consider what our duty is as members of the local church. And just because there's a shutdown doesn't mean that the local church's activities have stopped. We all as members have duties and gifts and we are accountable to Christ for those gifts that we have. Now, the apostolic church, all the members of the church were trained and equipped. They were, they, they were supposed to be. And that was the model that was being followed. That was the model, model that was being followed in the early church. They weren't pew warmers, so to speak. What happened was the church entered into the Middle Ages. Constantine legalized Christianity. The church was formalized. And then the church of the Dark Ages was a spectator church where the priest did all the ministry. He sang, he read in Latin. And if you didn't understand Latin, you couldn't understand it. And all you as a, as a, a local lay member could do is give money to church. And that was it. And, and in certain ways, we haven't gotten out of that spectator church mentality. And that spectator church mentality is really not of the word, but of the world. It is not of the word of God. Let us continue to look at God's model, as revealed in the book of Ephesians chapter 4, for the church and the results of what happens 
when the local church is knit together and working together in unity and harmony, when the leaders are training. You know, in certain churches, leaders want to hold on to their positions. It can very easily happen. And the, I've heard it before. Oh, nobody will take these positions. Oh, nobody will do this. Well, it's your job to train them. It's your job to train and equip. There should be no lifetime appointments on any local boards. Leaders should be training and equipping others to replace them because it's the job of leaders, as we see here, to train and equip, as it says here, for the equipping of the saints for the work of ministry. So everybody in the church has a duty and has a gift, and that gift has, now it might not be, the, it might not be the case that all members must be members of the board, but every member has a gift and a talent, and leaders have to encourage them to use it. And we are accountable as leaders to help to train and equip and to teach these principles as I am teaching now from the book of Ephesians. And we need to get out of that medieval spectator church back to the apostolic church model and to the true unity that happens when we hold to this biblical model in Ephesians. We're talking about fundamental belief number 14 unity of the body of Christ. We are not to be a spectator church. We are not to be a celebrity church. We are not to be a church of pew warmers, but we are to be a church that is there to minister. Now, everybody has a different gift. Somebody might have the gift of the word. They might have the gift of preaching. Somebody else might have the gift of hospitality. Somebody's spirit might be moved as the early deacons that were selected in the book of Acts chapter 6 to minister to the shut-ins. See, we don't all have the gift. We don't have every gift. But Jesus had all the gifts and Jesus did all those things. But as members, we have to work together in unity. So let's continue to read about that unity in Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 13 and it says the edifying of the body of Christ. See that that unity when the saints are equipped when everybody's working in harmony it edifies the body of Christ till we all come to the unity of faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God to a perfect man to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ and then look what it says here that we should no longer be children tossed to and fro carried about with every wind of doctrine so just as that illustration I showed when the fingers when the members were apart from one another the seeds those false doctrines that worldliness was able to penetrate and influence the church but when we have this model of Ephesians working in the church and the doctrine of God is sound in the mind of the believers and, and we are working together in harmony it says we should no longer be children tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine by the trickery of men in the cunning craftiness of deceitful plotting but speaking the truth in love may grow up in all things into him who is the head that is Christ you see and it says from whom the whole body that is the church joined and knit together by what every joint supplies see we are accountable as joints in the body of Christ see when you fragment when you come away from the church when you are not committed to the local church when your gifts and talents are not are not being used in the local church you are not supplying what you ought to supply and we are accountable to God for our talents we're accountable to Christ and so we have to pray and surrender ourselves to Christ to find our gifts to locate our gifts and to use our gifts within the local church within the local church and outside of the local church Okay, so it says, joined and knit together by what every joint supplies according to the effective working by which every part does its share, Ephesians 4, 16. So now because of the coronavirus and the shutdown is not an excuse to now go and do your own thing. You are still a member. And what language the Bible uses of the body of Christ to describe the church, not as just an organization, not as just a voluntary organization, but the body of Christ and of course we are accountable to the body of Christ we don't want to sin against the body of Christ and, and there is something of that in the context of first Corinthians chapter 11 when we read about communion we don't want to sin against the body of Christ 
causes growth of the body for the edifying of itself in love. So, well, I can't say I'm a popular speaker, that's for sure. So anybody who's listening to me isn't doing it for entertainment's sake. <laughs> anyway, I want to use another illustration here. Okay, so this is uh, what I'm going to use to symbolize the unity of the church, the true unity in Christ. When the church is uni unified and uh, the members are working together in harmony, what this symbolizes, the enemy can't penetrate. The false doctrines cannot penetrate. Wickedness cannot penetrate. But what happens when we are separated from one another? That's what the enemy wants. Divide and conquer. The false doctrines can easily enter and explode the church. See, there is a false unity of the world, and there is the true unity of the word. In the book of Revelation, in the book of prophecy, we read about that ultimate false end-time union that will occur in the book of Revelation chapter 16 and verse 13. And I saw three unclean spirits like, like frogs coming out of the mouth of the dragon, out of the mouth of the beast, out of the mouth of the false prophet. So here we see this end-time union between the dragon, the beast, and the false prophet. An end-time worldly union. See, it is a union that is rooted in selfishness and self-centeredness. That is what we have by nature, as the Bible clearly says in the book of Romans, chapter 7 and verse 18, in me there is nothing good that is in my flesh. See, in our flesh, we are selfish and self-centered, and that selfishness is what the false union of the world is based on. What can you do for me? It's transactional. I'll do this for you, you do that for me. We see it a lot in politics. I'll give you this, you give me that. You give me the vote, I'll give you what you want. You see, but the Bible is saying we're not to be transactional, we'll be transformational. We are to be transformational. As the Bible tells us in the book of Romans, chapter 12 and verse 2, be not conformed to this world, but, but transformed by the renewing of your mind, so that you might prove that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. The Bible is saying we are to have the mind of Christ, 1 Corinthians chapter 2 and verse 16. But who knows the mind of the Lord that he might instruct him? But we have the mind of Christ. So we're to have the mind of Christ. We're to have that union. The Bible says in the book of 1 Corinthians chapter 2, and that was 1 Corinthians 2, 16, but if we look at 1 Corinthians chapter 2 and verse number 12, it says, Now we have received not the spirit of the world, but the spirit that is from God, that we might know the things that are freely given us by God. And it says, These things we also speak, not with words which men's wisdom teaches, but which the Holy Spirit teaches, comparing spiritual things to spiritual things. And then it says, but the natural man does not receive the things from the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness to him, nor can he know them, because they are spiritually discerned. So we have to have that union of the Spirit. We are to not be conformed to this world. See, the world and worldliness, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the pride of life, in the context of of first John, first John chapter two, fifteen and sixteen. We read about that worldliness in those terms. Uh first John two, fifteen and sixteen, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the pride of life. And really lust is self centeredness, self centeredness. What can I get out of this? You see, when we have that self-centered attitude, when we do not have Christ in our in our hearts, and we don't have the Holy Spirit, what we are really doing is we're drawn by we're drawn by selfish impulses. You know, what can I get out of this? How does this sustain me? How does this build me up? How what can you do for me? You see, when Christ came to this world, He didn't come and, and say, you know, what can you do for me? What could we do for Him? What did we do for Christ? What did we give Christ? We gave him a crown of thorns. And what did he give us? Eternal life. The Bible says, Greater love has no man than this than to lay down his life for his friends. The Bible tells us in the book of Romans, chapter 5, 7 and 8, it tells us that um, scarcely for a righteous man will one be willing to die. For a good man, someone might be willing to die. But God demonstrated his love for us in this. While we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. We didn't do anything. 
It wasn't transactional, but it is transformational when you receive the love of Christ in your life. And so that, that, that's the true unity, the true union, the true community of Christ that we saw in the apostolic period, in the apostolic church, where they shared everything in common. And we have to get back to that, that true union, that true unity. You know, these are times that can work for us or against us. Because the Bible says all things work together for the good of those that love the Lord and are called according to His purpose. We can have victory over the coronavirus. There are going to be more pestilences that come. There are going to be more inconveniences that come. Should they be a reason for the church to fragment and fall apart? No. We must have the union of the body of Christ. You know, I'm going to close talking about the false union of the world a little bit more. In the book of... Um, First, I'm going to go to the book of Romans, then I'm going to go to the book of Revelation. I talked already about Revelation, and uh, Revelation chapter 16 and verse 13, that false union, the union, this threefold union, this false union, this false worldly union between the beast, the dragon, and the false prophet, to go out and to deceive the whole world into doing war against God. What a deception. What man can think they can defeat God. But that's the deception. That is what happens when we do not receive the truth. In verse 14, Revelation 16, 14, For they are spirits of demons performing signs which go out to the kings of the earth and of the whole world to gather them to the battle of the great day of God Almighty. Deceptions. Deceptions, end time deceptions. Now we're, we're reading here about the sixth bowl of wrath. So the bowls of wrath are being poured out on the enemies of God, on those who have chosen the world rather than the word. I want to talk, before I go into that a little more, I want to go to the book of Romans, and I want to go to Romans chapter 16. Uh, Romans chapter 16. Let's go to Romans 16 if we could. And Romans chapter 16, I want to get this as an urgent message today. Romans 16 and verse 17. Now I urge you, brethren, note those who cause divisions and offenses contrary to the doctrine which you have learned. Contrary to the what? To the doctrine, to the doctrine, to the doctrine. The word of God, the word of God is profitable for correction, for instruction, for doctrine. That's why we have the Word of God. Second Timothy three sixteen and 17 tells us these things. Uh, I got the door ringing. <laughs> Doorbell ring. Can you go open the door? I gotta finish this. So anyway, I've gotta finish this very quickly. And um, so, Paul is urging the members of the church to beware of the those who are going to bring false doctrines and come in with their smooth speeches. You have to carry stuff. I've like got to carry stuff, so I've got to run and I got to finish in one minute. Tell her one minute. Tell her I'm finishing this one minute. And so finally, you know, ultimately that false threefold union, that threefold union in the Book of Revelation will be destroyed with the Word. You see, Satan wants to destroy the church with the world, to get the world into the church. See, when the church is full of worldliness, there's no purpose for the church anymore. It's the same as the world. And so Satan destroys it that way. But Christ is ultimately going to destroy the false union of the world with the Word. We see that happening symbolically in the Book of Revelation 16 and verse 19. In Revelation 16, verse 19, we see that great city divided in three parts. That is the final division of the false threefold union. Revelation 16, 19, and ultimately, as the book of Revelation chapter 19 and verse 21 reveals, the false union of the enemy between the beast, the false prophet, and the dragon is destroyed ultimately with the word of God. Let me close, and I'll just close right now by reading Revelation. And it's Revelation chapter 19, and what did I say? Verse 21, And the rest were killed with the sword which proceeded from the mouth of him who sat on the horse, that is Christ, and all the birds of uh, and all the birds were filled with their flesh. See, this very graphic and symbolic language shows the ultimate end of the union of the world destroyed by the Word. The Word of God will triumph. The doctrine of God will triumph. God bless you all, and I hope this was a blessing to you.